Well, I've, um, it's really a pleasure to be here, this distinguished university, uh, um, one of the most distinguished, really, in Europe. And I, I'm, it's just a tremendous honor for me to be in, invited to join you. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about what to say to you today. And uh, I, I, um, I know that there are many levels of sophistication from the highest to sort of introductory about American politics. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of background, and then we'll talk more uh, about the current election. A and um, I'm not going to go on a terribly long time. I'd like to take questions from you. So um, J as Jerry referred to, I was asked to talk about the midterm elections. And I wrote to some European friends, uh, journalists, and said, well, this is what I've been asked to tell. And I got the, uh, the email back uh, from um, uh, uh, one in particular. She said, uh, you'd better tell what midterm elections are. Parliamentary system is different than uh, the American system. So I'll give you a little bit of background on that. Um, in the US Constitution, if, if, yeah, for those of you who know all this, I apologize, but I'm trying to put down, uh, make sure everybody's along with us. In the US Constitution, there are three political branches of government. Two, uh, two are in the Congress. The Congress is really two branches. One is the US Senate, which, uh, which uh, is two senators per state, all 50 states. And one third of them is elected every two years. So it's constant renewal, but it's not, never a total turnover. And that's very important for this year to care, bear in mind. The other is the House of Representatives. It's apportioned by population. Each state gets at least one member, uh, and it's elected every two years. Uh, so this year, the entire House of Representatives and one third of the Senate is up. The elections you hear most about are the presidential elections, which are every four years. Uh, and uh, the uh, president is elected by an electoral college, which is a product of the popular vote. People, when they vote in their states, are actually voting for members of the Electoral College. Each state, remember, is apportioned in the House of Representatives by population and has two senators. The number of electors is a combination of those two. So if you're in a state with, uh, say, 20 members of the House of Representatives, you'll have 22 votes in the Electoral College. Uh, most years, uh, almost all years, uh, the popular vote and the electoral vote line up together. There are occasional times when elections are very close in the popular vote and maybe and very close in the electoral vote, which is what we had in two, the year 2000. Uh, the electoral vote ultimately was one vote in uh, uh, a vote, one vote margin for Mr. Bush, and he was a little bit short in the popular vote. Not much, but a little bit. That's very rare, but it has occasionally happened. Uh, in those presidential election years, ag again, the House of Representatives is entirely up, and one-third of the Senate is up. So as you see, that's, we're really on a two-year cycle. One year, the President, third of the Senate, the House. The next year, the uh, sen uh, third of the Senate and the House again. The third year, the th third year really the fourth year. These are two-year cycles. Uh, the House of Representatives, the, uh, a third of the Senate, and the President again. So that's what we have now. It's uh, some, in other systems, parliamentary systems, you have, um, uh, you'll find special elections and that sort of thing, but not all the up. Um, the, um, in, uh, in this year, uh, the um, Senate is fairly closely divided. Uh, it, a vote a change, uh, there are 100 senators, a change of six would give the Senate over to the Republicans and away from the Democrats who've held it since, um, uh, since uh, 2006. Uh, uh, that is the big question this year. Uh, the House of Representatives, no one thinks that the House of Representatives will turn over. It is currently held by the Republicans. Now the reason, uh, the, the votes in the House are fairly close, but the Democrats uh, tend to have their votes concentrated all in a small, small areas around the country, and the Republicans are spread out. 
Uh, so Republicans tend to win their House seats by a margin of about 55% of the vote. Democrats tend to run, win their House seats by a margin of 80, 85% of the vote. That's a question of demography. It's a question of how the population is distributed. Democrats tend to be concentrated in small areas, as I say, and altogether um, uh, the districts that are democratically dominated in Republican areas, you tend to have a mix, a broader mix of, of uh, party affiliations. So as it works out uh, in the current uh, um, uh, situation, uh, Republicans, uh, even with a close vote, Republicans will tend to have a pretty large margin uh, because they're winning by smaller margins in each uh, house. This is, uh, uh, so this year, we have no doubt at this point, it would be a big surprise, I should say, if the Republicans were to lose the House. V very big, almost uh, no one is counting on it. Um, so the question up is the Senate. But before I get to the Senate, I want to talk to you about a few long-term trends in American politics. And I'll talk about several demarcation points which set the foundation for everything that happens politically in the United States. Uh, the first of these demarcation points is actually more than, um, um, more than a century and a half old, and that's the American Civil War. The American Civil War, of course, was North and South, but it also created large populations, particularly in the South at that time, um, of Democrats who, uh, saw the Republicans as the party of the Union and, and, uh, and they had rebelled against it, and in the North as Republicans. My family grew up in a state called Pennsylvania, which is near New York. Uh, the, um, my um, great-great-great-grandfather was in the Civil War on the Union Army, and uh, there is a road passing through that town called the Grand Army of the Republic Highway. That was the um, uh, Grand Army of the Republic was the Union Army in the Civil War. You can imagine how the people in that town voted for more than a century, and even today vote. They vote Republican, and very much that's uh, conditioned by uh, that, the heritage of that conflict. The next big demarcation line in, the, um, uh, in uh, American politics was the Great Depression of the 1930s. That brought Franklin Roosevelt into office. And uh, it, it moved many groups that had been Republican or that were unaffiliated into the Democratic column. Uh, uh, labor uh, unions, people who were in labor unions, people who were, in, um, uh, who were affiliated with the, um, uh, who were in big cities, tended to move towards the Democrats. And even today, big cities in the United States tend to be more Democrat, tend to be heavily Democrat. There are a few exceptions, but not very many. Uh, labor unions remain Democrat. Uh, there have been some unions that broke away, but not very many. Uh, in, the, uh, civil, in the Depression also, African Americans, who for the obvious reason that Republicans had been led the fight against slavery and the Democratic Party was associated with those uh, for the um, Confederacy, uh, African Americans after the Civil War were, uh, were Republican. But beginning in the Great Depression, because so many had been hurt so badly by the Depression and the Roosevelt administration provided a great deal of relief, uh, they started moving towards, uh, the, Dem towards the Democrats. Uh, that's the second great demarcation line in American politics. And when I was growing up, the coalition of Franklin Roosevelt really dominated most of American politics. Uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate, uh, through most of my growing up, were uh, in Democratic hands. It was uh, sometime in the 50s, but in the 60s and 70s, and uh, up until 1980, both uh, the um, uh, Democrats held both, uh, and uh, uh, the, why, whereas the um, presidency tended to move back and forth, as it still does. Uh, the presidency, of course, Dwight Eisenhower, a hero of the Second World War, was president in the 50s. 
Then John Kennedy, by a very narrow mar margin, became president in 1960, uh, was elected president in 1960. Um, he, he, of course, was assassinated in office, uh, but uh, Lyndon Johnson took over and enjoyed a very huge uh, victory in 64. But Richard Nixon, by a very narrow margin, took over in 1968. Uh, he was a Republican. Uh, when uh, Nixon uh, and was impeached or was um, resigned from office and Gerald Ford took over, following him, uh, following them, Jimmy Carter uh, became president, a Democrat. You can see it going back and forth, and this is one of my messages today. American politics is very finely balanced. Sometimes it looks like uh, it's all one party or the other, but in fact, it moves back and forth quite a bit. Uh, then, uh, after Mr. Carter had only one term, uh, of course, Ronald Reagan came in. I was a speechwriter for Ronald Reagan. He was followed by George Bush of his own party. Now, that's unusual for a pre uh, in this period, for a president to be followed by a member of his own party. Again, there's this fine balance in American politics. It reflected the popular enthusiasm for what Mr. Reagan had achieved and also a desire that uh, the Republicans stay in charge at least until the Soviet Union fell, which was in the process at that time. Uh, and and um, then once Mr. Bush uh, left office, it was Mr. Clinton. We were back to the Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat. After Mr. Clinton, uh, Mr., uh, the second Mr. Bush, by a very close margin, Mr. Clinton was elected by a very close margin. You get this feeling of how finally balanced. There isn't a party that dominates American politics. Uh, and uh, then after Mr. Uh, Clint, uh, after Mr. Bush, of course, Mr. Obama. Actually, for a president coming in, Mr. Obama had the largest margin other than um, Mr. Reagan of the uh, prior number of presidents. Um, um, larger margin than uh, John F. Kennedy for his first time in, uh, first election, a larger margin than um, than Richard Nixon, a larger margin certainly than um, 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 President Clinton. Uh, in his reelection, he had a smaller margin than most presidents do. That's an anomaly of the uh, uh, Obama presidency reflected some disillusionment with his performance and with the performance of the country in that time. Uh, but my first, uh, I was a little surprised when I uh, got the uh, announcement saying, are the Republicans doomed? And uh, the, uh, the pattern in the United States is that after each of these elections, you tend to hear commentators, particularly if the Republicans lost, saying, oh, the Republican Party is out of business. Uh, they are, you heard it in 64 when Barry Goldwater ran, and the Republican Party really did look out of business at that time. Very, very low margins. Um, but you heard it again uh, when uh, Richard Nick, uh, after Gerald Ford left, uh, four years later, Richard, uh, uh, um, President Reagan was in. Uh, and, uh, but after Mr. Bush left office, you heard again, is the Republican Party out of business? To be fair, you hear a little bit of this when the Democrats win. Uh, and there's, it's, it tends to be the hyperventilation of the press. You know hyperventilation. <sighs> And the press is very good at hyperventilation, and they hyperventilate a lot. And I, uh, uh, I um, was, uh, Jerry mentioned that I was on television. Uh, I've done a fair amount of television, and I did quite a lot this election time, and uh, to the point of being up for, I think, 48 hours, most of it uh, with various TV places. And uh, towards the end, I was getting questions, particularly from the BBC, about, oh, um, you know, isn't the, the Republican Party can't survive this way? Well, uh, the election wasn't that big, as I said, for the Democrats, um, uh, Mr. Obama's reelection, and that was a strange question. But it's uh, uh, anchored in an other big movement in American politics. We have had in the United States a great deal of immigration over the last uh, 20, 30 years. Much of it. Um, uh, unlike the prior wave of integration. The first waves, the uh, waves of integration um, early on, uh, which is to say in the early 19th century, tended to come from <coughs> the British Isles 
and uh, German-speaking countries. And so you find a lot of, of um, English, uh, Scottish, um, um, Irish. Uh, then you also find in the United States a lot of uh, German-speaking populations or people who uh, trace their ancestry back to uh, that part of Europe. Uh, and then uh, in the late 19th century, you tended to find many more uh, people from here, from uh, meaning Hungary, uh, from Poland, from the Czech, what is now the Czech Republic, uh, and um, also from um, the German speaking was also Scandinavia, so that's early and mid, uh, mid 19th century. And uh, here, uh, and Scandinavia in the late 19th century as well, uh, you find people from Russia, uh, you find people from um, uh, this area of the world. In this period, we've had a great deal of migration in particular from Latin America. And uh, the uh, Democrats are, have been winning them recently. Some of that is regional. You have some states where the Republicans do pretty well among uh, Mexican Americans and others, other states where they don't do as well, and some of that has to do with local traditions in the United States. So uh, what we have been hearing is, oh, you didn't do well among uh, Hispanic Americans, that is to say people from any of the Latin American countries in this last election, which is true, and you didn't do well in, um, in, among African Americans, which is true, although totally expected. We have our first African-American president. We aren't going to win much in the way of African-American votes until uh, he's off the scene. I mean, we by Republicans. Uh, the Democrats have sold themselves as more with um, uh, minorities, but we and have been trying to loosen uh, or change immigration laws, thinking that that appealed to my uh, Hispanics in particular. Uh, the um, the, uh, as they say, the jury is still a bit out on that. Uh, one of the most um, popular uh, uh, congressmen among Hispanics, at least within his district in California, maybe the most popular, uh, who is not Hispanic himself, has ha taken a very strong stand against um, uh, for dealing with Ill illegal immigration, and yet he's very popular among Hispanics with voters within his own district. So it's a little uncertain. Uh, uh, how how um, Mexican American voters go with um, uh, on these issues, but what is clear is that the economy matters a lot to them, a and uh, the economy matters a lot to uh, uh, basically a, a wide range of voters. And the American economy has not been doing uh, as well as Americans believe it should. Uh, the um, uh, in the after the crash, we're in a period right now of a very slow recovery. Uh, a typical American recovery, if you look at the jobs, is a sharp V-shape. Jobs drop fast and they come up fast. This recovery has not been like that. The jobs came, went way down, about, uh, about twice as large a proportion of jobs were lost as, as would be typical in a recovery since the end of the Second World War. They've come up very slowly. I'm not even sure at this point that we have passed the number of jobs that we lost in the recovery, whereas normally we've recovered all the jobs back in a few months uh, after the recovery begins. Again, normally it's a sharp drop and a sharp rise. It's been a sharp drop and a gentle rise since uh, 2009. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, we're in a position right now where uh, young people in particular have been, um, uh, people like yourselves, have been uh, hurt by this. Uh, if you were a high school graduate, in a recent high school graduate, not planning to go to college in the United States, and had uh, left uh, high school within the last year or two, the chances are six, more than six out of 10 that you would not have a job right now, or the job you had would be uh, not one that would even require a high school education. If you were a college graduate in the United States, the chances would be 25%, one in four, that you'd be in the same position, either unemployed or what is called underemployed. 
That is a big issue in the United States. It's an under the surface issue, uh, the, um, uh, uh, but it is a defining issue in my judgment right now in American politics. Another defining issue is, uh, is the uh, global situation. Uh, it's not as we expected at this point in the, uh, Mr. Obama's presidency. He had uh, announced he would have a reset with Russia, that things would go better, things have gone much worse. He announced that he was going to have new policies in the Middle East and things were, would go better. Uh, things are seen to go worse. You may have a different view, but this is, uh, there's quite a bit of alarm at what's happened in um, the Middle East. And, uh, we, um, uh, and things have not gone well in uh, the relations of, um, in settling the um, uh, disputes between Israel and its neighbors. So there is a sense right now, uh, in, uh, I should say in 1980, President uh, Reagan, when he was running for office, ran on, uh, asked this question the night, a uh, couple of nights before the election in a uh, nationally televised talk. He said, are you, ask yourself, are you better off now than you were four years ago, beginning of the Carter presidency? Uh, and, and the answer was pretty obvious. People thought, very few Americans thought they were, we had a difficult economy right now. You could ask the same today, get the same answer, but the other answer today is, are you safer now than you were four years, uh, five, six years ago? And the answer there is clearly not. So this is also an issue underlying in American politics. These are big issues, but there are a number of what are of much smaller issues. Uh, issues of the environment, issues of, of um, uh, in particular, health care, and also a broad issue, and the health care reform bill, I should say, that Mr. Obama put across, but also uh, an issue that doesn't get as much discussion in the media, and you may not have heard much about, which I'd like to talk to you about today, a kind of look at something that I believe is foundational in American politics at the moment. And uh, the emblem of this is the Tea Party, but the Tea Party reflects something much, much more profound than just uh, the people who identify with it. And, I'd, uh, and has some uh, um, uh, equivalence in the Democratic Party as well. Uh, in, and to explain what I mean, let me take you to 2004 when President George W. Bush won re-election by a very large margin. Uh, there were a number of reasons, the state of the economy, the way he had handled uh, American defense after the attacks of, of 2001, uh, feeling that he, uh, he had done well in that, um, and, and, more, and probably equally that his opponent was not up for taking over at that, uh, at that point. Uh, but in 2005, in June, I was having dinner in Washington with uh, a number of people, journalists and uh, political people. Uh, uh, to, uh, there were about 30, 40 people at the dinner, and there was a great deal of discussion. We were to hear from uh, uh, Senator John McCain, who later ran for president, uh, and uh, he was late for a vote. Uh, if you're having dinners with members of Congress, uh, just expect that they'll be late because there's always a late vote. Uh, and um, uh, and one, one of the people there was a prominent pollster, uh, a pollster I respect a great deal who I think is very astute. She said that she was finding in her polls that a big chunk of the Bush vote of 2004, remember that was uh, June, and so the vote was in November, so we're talking only eight months earlier, was disillusioned and uh, breaking away from the Republican Party. And it was breaking away over a uh, question of too much domestic US spending, a uh, return of, de of uh, deficit spending. Uh, and alarm over that. We have, uh, remember that in the later Clinton years, we had for the first time since the 50s, uh, we had surpluses in the American uh, federal budget. Um, and, and that federal budget um, 
there were even there was even talk at that point of retiring all of American the American government's debt. Uh, the surpluses were that large, and they were coming on that fast. Under Mr. Bush, that uh, and the Republicans, who were supposed to be the ones who would control the size of government and the spending of government, uh, that reversed. Deficits came back. The Republic, uh, Mr. Bush and his people said, "Well, a lot of this has to do with." Uh, um, the, uh, the having had to go uh, defend the country as a result of the 2001 attacks and the aftermath and the change of risks. Uh, but there were an awful lot of people who felt that Mr. Bush and his colleagues and the Republicans had been inattentive to how to cut spending and reduce, uh, reduce the size and reach of the U.S. government. Uh, and uh, in any event, and were increasingly disillusioned, and that's what this pollster was picking up. Uh, in, in that was a view that sunk in and started to define uh, new, a new dynamic in American politics. Uh, we had had, uh, I told you about the Civil War and the um, uh, New Deal coalition, we then had, uh, just to back up a moment, we of course had a reforming of coalitions in 1980, which uh, under Mr. Reagan, and the coalitions that formed under Mr. Reagan, you hear about Reagan Democrats who were really um, American Catholics who had gone to the Republican Party uh, from the uh, migrations of the, um, both the 19th and early, uh, late ni mid, late, mid, uh, We'll try to get these words out. Mid, late 19th century and early and um, up until the 1920s, those, those groups had voted Democrat. They moved over to the Republicans. Part of the uh, Southern vote had moved over to the Republicans. Uh, once um, segregation was off the table uh, and, and uh, um, there were the racial issues of that sort were uh, moved into the background. Republicans would not have, of the North, would not have allied with uh, anyone in the South so long as uh, segregation was an issue. Uh, so it opened up some groups moving over. There were also the social issues that moved groups over uh, around the country. Uh, and uh, that coalition, though, was looking for a reduction in the size of government. And as I say, that coalition put Mr. Bush in in 2000. Uh, by a narrow margin, they had some doubts about the Republicans after Mr. Reagan on this score, and those who were doubtful had moved, had gone with the pro candidacy. Uh, but also, uh, these groups, um, uh, these groups came back uh, to a large extent in 2004. But by 2005, they were starting to have their doubts again, many of them, and they broke away and went to the Democrats or didn't vote in 2006, continued in that way and even bigger numbers in 2008, giving Mr. Obama huge margins. And then, of course, with the financial crisis, Mr. Obama and, and the uh, desires in any event of his people, Mr. Obama and the Democrats who controlled the government at that point started running up huge amounts of spending, started uh, put through the Obama uh, care, uh, health care bill. The more, uh, the, the president's popularity uh, from those two uh, events can be tr uh, traced. You can see the more he talked about the, his health care bill and the more he talked about the spending, the farther down his numbers went until they hit about 40 percent. And they continued that way th through most of the rest of his first term. Um, the, uh, these people uh, went right back to the Republicans, these people who had broken away after 2004. They went right back to the Republicans, and the Republicans won the House in 2010. Now, the uh, Senate Republicans did not win, and they did not win because, um, partly because of the peculiarities of the Senate. There were a lot of uh, Democratic seats up, but also, frankly, they put up some bad candidates and uh, who didn't campaign very well. And there was still a great deal of doubt among this group that went back about whether the Republicans were really going to deal with these uh, issues of the solvency of the United States government and underlying it, 
of uh, the economy, because these groups also saw the economy as directly tied to those questions and the slow recovery tied to those questions. Now we're uh, the same thing uh, again in 2012. The Republicans did not put up a candidate who satisfied the questions of those people. And so what you saw in 2012 was that the, re the um, actual voting, level of voting dropped from 2008, dropped substantially by about 7 million votes. Uh, and that's unusual in American politics. Just the natural growth of the country tends to push up the number of people uh, voting with each successive election. It didn't happen this time, and uh, there are various theories, but my theory and that of a number of others is that, Mr. that the people who did not vote were largely the kind of people I've described who had voted or were like the people who had voted, had the same concerns, had voted for Mr. Bush in 2004, had abandoned the Republicans, had embraced the Democrats in 2008, both because of Mr. Obama's uh, attractiveness and because of how they uh, felt about uh, the issues I've talked about, uh, uh, were alarmed after that, went and voted Republican again in 2010, but still did not fully trust the Republicans. And, uh, and so uh, in 2012, didn't show up to vote. They couldn't vote for the president and his party, but they could, couldn't vote for the Republicans either. And what we had then was essentially a tie. You have, I remember I started by saying, talking about the three branches of government. The Rep in 2012, the Republicans won the House of Representatives. The Democrats won the Senate. And remember I said the Democrats won the White House in a very narrow margin for a re-election. That's where we stand today. People talk, you'll hear in the news, about how there's gridlock in Washington, how the government of the United States is broken. You've heard these sorts of uh, statements. That, what's underlying is not that the United States and its government are broken, it's that the United States and its government are undecided. It is, the country is very closely balanced between the two parties and has not, and we are basically, in a sense, what we're doing, in a sense, the last election was the, if you, you might characterize it, if the American people are the boss, as they are for those who serve in Washington, the boss called the uh, subordinates into the, their office and said, I want this fighting, uh, this bickering between you to stop, and I want you to go out and figure out how to solve the problems. And the two, two subordinates, the three subordinates, I suppose, but the Democrats and the Republicans, the two subordinates went out and they kept bickering. And that's where we stand right now. You have seen some break in the bickering, some budget deals, some uh, uh, now some unity, particularly the Republicans backing the president in his foreign policy, uh, more than the Democrats, I believe, at this stage. You've seen some of that. Uh, and that's because there is a strong understanding in, in Congress that the uh, standoff between the parties can go only so far but it's still largely there. The American people have not quite decided between the agenda of the Democrats and the agenda of the Republicans, and no one on either side has figured out how to pull these two groups together, uh, these, this floating group that has moved back and forth between the party over securely to their own party. That's the big question in my judgment in American politics today. Um, there, some of the democrat, demographic questions of the growth of the Hispanic vote, uh, in particular, tie into that, because that vote is asking, fundamentally, uh, asking where are the jobs as well, but neither party has a good answer, at least one that uh, uh, re they respond to and say, yeah, that's right. And that, yeah, that's right reaction from the American people, neither party has figured out how to get it. And so the parties are uh, at this kind of um, 
standoff. Now, there are technical issues going on. Uh, the Democrats, uh, when I was growing up and in the early years, always said they had the more money. It's clear now they, I'm sorry, the Republicans were always said to have more money to spend on elections. Democrats balanced that off by um, the organizational support from uh, organized labor in particular. But um, now it's clear the Democrats have more money and they have more money in this election. Uh, there are some other technical factors that are going on. The Democrats, at least last time, were far better at the use of social media. The Republicans are claiming they've caught up, but their performance last time was so abysmal, so horrible, that it's not, uh, you'd have to wait to see uh, performance with social media, even with polling last time was so horrible. They, um, um, as an aside, uh, Mitt Romney and um, um, uh, his team thought that uh, they had won on election morning. They thought it because the, uh, uh, their polls were showing they were winning among the Republicans and they were winning among independents. So they said, well, we, we win. Well, nobody ever wins without winning uh, independents, at least. Uh, but in fact, the, the people who identified as Democrats turned out in such large numbers. And the people who identified themselves in as Republicans or independents, this gets back to my swinging group that didn't show up, didn't show up large numbers of them. And between the two, the Democrats uh, won just uh, narrowly last time. How is that going to play this time? These technical factors along with whether anyone brings that floating group back, along with uh, whether anyone has a, uh, uh, something convincing for the other group. My guess is that however the Senate goes, it will be very narrow, that the Republicans will have one or two vote margin or the Democrats will have a one or two vote margin. There may be some surprises, but that's the likelihood. My projection is that the, um, and, and this is not at all, um, this, is, this is widely believed, is that the Republicans will win or even might win more of the House this time than last time. In other words, what's going to happen will be in exactly the same place we are now in the United States, undecided between the agendas of these two parties, still expecting them to go in the room. The boss has sent them back to that room and said, figure it out. Don't give me whining. Don't give me, uh, give me excuses. Give me an answer. I expect the two of you to come up with that answer. That's where we are in the United States right now. Is the Republican Party doomed? No. Is the Democratic Party doomed? No. Is the United States doomed? I don't think so either. That's democracy. Sometimes it's messy. And uh, the people ultimately decide. Thank you.